Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Quickly, how many have ever heard of Ernie Hassey and Signature Sound? Seriously, anybody? Anybody? You want to go see him tonight, Larry? Good, they're yours. Hang on. We have a winner. <laughs> we, uh, that's actually where we got married, Family Worship Center. Joe came up, did the wedding there long, long ago. And good. We tried to get him away at first service. Nobody took him. We had a concert this evening. And hey, let Al, the bass player, know. He'll be blessed to know you can go, because I guess Diane got sick and couldn't go. So it's cool. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. You guys can all ask Larry next week how it went. Check with Allison. See what you're missing. Bring a CD back for him, Larry. Father, we thank you for your word. Again, thank you for your great faithfulness to us. Thank you for this example of those who trusted you. And they were not disappointed. In fact, Lord, here we are thousands of years later remembering what they have done because of their faith. I pray now in this second service, you would take your word, you would open it to each heart in the room, you would minister to us, Lord, anew and afresh, as only you can by the power of your Holy Spirit. We are so grateful, Lord, that you have invited us into a relationship with you. You called us, you told us you first loved us. You're the one who did the drawing of us to yourself. We have been invited into the family of God. We are grateful, Lord. We pray that we might grow bold in faith, that our lives would be used for your glory, Lord. And so take your word and open it again to our hearts, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I was sharing with First Service uh, this weekend. There's a competition going on. One of my daughters is in. And uh, it's, at, it's, an, it's at an alma mater for me, where I went 20 years ago. So I was down there yesterday and walking around and looking. And boy, you see things in a different light 20 years later, you know, and there's some things I saw there, I got saved when I was there. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a room that probably cost more than I think at least half of our building, you know, and other things, you kind of go, huh. And then, and then I bumped into something I haven't been around in about 20 years. And that was the attitude, the attitude of the, the so-called educated a sense of they're in a, a special club, you know, and, and I, I knew and I saw it before, but to go back and sit there and see some, and, and it's just, it's real clear. Then I was thinking about, you know, the next morning I get to teach in Hebrews, and Hebrews doesn't care where you went to school or if you even finished school. Hebrews 11 cares about, do you trust God? And so we know the names of these people thousands of years later, and yet there are people graduating now who think they're about to take the world by the horns. And yet probably most of us will never know their names. But for those who are great in faith, here we are thousands of years later studying them and hoping to be more like them. So interesting contrast the Lord would give me in two days, yesterday versus today. So chapter 10, let's review a few short verses. Verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience. After that, you have done the will of God that you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. And if any man, who, how many read Habakkuk, by the way? How many went and checked it out? All right, at least some of you did. The just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now keep that idea of drawing back in mind as we move on. We are not of them who draw back, second time, unto perdition. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. Faith is the hypostasis, the word is here. It is that which rests upon facts, the substance. 
of things hoped for, the evidence, that is a proof or means of proof to convince. So faith is that which rests upon facts of things hoped for, the proof of things or the means of proof to convince of things not seen. It is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. God created the heavens and the earth, and we went through this at length in Genesis, how you can look around, there's much evidence of the complexity, the design, the handiwork of God. We went and looked at the fact that there are limiting factors to the age of the earth. There's the evolutionary model that, that supposes billions of years, and yet there are things like even the distance of our moon from the earth and how far it's moving away that limit the age of that earth universe and the things that were created. We went through these, a number of limiting factors, different issues, the salinization of the sea, the erosions of the mountains, how fast those things happen. And the Bible's clear, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we've been through this. We can go back to Genesis. You can study it again. But through faith, we understand the worlds were framed and God has put evidence throughout his creation. But this is what gets me in verse 3. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. When this was written by the Holy Spirit through this author, did they have telescopes? Microscopes. Electron microscopes. Nanotechnology. Spectrometers for analysis, grass chromatographs. What did they have? Eyes. And when you consider what we have unlocked in the atomic, subatomic, molecular, DNA, for example, world, compared to what they could understand, listen just how right on this statement is. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You've got to get way below that level to see them. And our technology is finally caught up to this verse. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. Hold your finger here for a minute. Turn to Jude, the book just before Revelation, to the right. Jude, verse 11. And it wouldn't hurt to stick your bolton in there. You'll be back to it in a little bit. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after their error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. The idea here is... The false teachers, they've gone in the way of Cain. What is the way of Cain? Abel brought a sacrifice from his flocks, yes? And so he, provided, he came before God with a blood atonement. We learn from Hebrews chapter 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Abel comes with a blood atonement. Where did he get that idea from? Adam and Eve. How do we know? Well, when they sinned, the Lord God gave them skins, which come from... Animals, so there was a blood atonement to literally cover their nakedness, which is a result of their sin. And so Abel approaches in the same fashion that, that Adam and Eve had learned from God, a blood atonement will now cover you to approach God. Cain shows up with the produce of his field. And so the way of Cain is he brings what is essentially the result of his own efforts or works. The way of Cain is seeking to worship God in his own terms. God has already established terms. And that is, it takes the shedding of blood for the remission of sin. Adam and Eve, first thing they get to understand as they're leaving the garden, blood atonement. Abel, following in those steps, approaches God by blood atonement. Cain did something different. In fact, you've heard the old saying, the reason you know, Cain offered a sacrifice is because he's not Abel. But you can study it more in Genesis. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, blood atonement. Without having a New Testament, without having an Old Testament, without having the sacrificial, sacrificial system law, without having Leviticus, Abel, in what he understood of God, realized if I'm going to approach God, there has to be a blood sacrifice. There has to be blood atonement. And so by faith, he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. 
by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it his witness, he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, because God hath translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. What word jumps out at you in that verse? Three times? Translated. By faith, Enoch was, the word used here translated, is a change of place or condition that he should not see death and was not found because God had given him a change of place or condition for before his translation slightly different, before his being conveyed from one place to another, he had this testimony. What testimony? That he pleased God. Turn back to Jude, verse 14. And Enoch, same one we're studying, also the seventh from Adam. How many would agree he's pretty new to the whole world there? Seventh from Adam's early in the creation. Seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, these false teachers and God's judgment. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince or convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Do you know what he's talking about? The second coming of Christ. When he'll make his enemies his footstool. What version Bible is he reading? There is none. So Enoch, by faith, had this testimony that he pleased God. He was a man who sought God by faith. And as he sought God by faith, look, God began to give him revelation and understanding of what the plan of God is for this world. Enoch, obviously troubled by the ungodliness and the wicked he saw in that pre-flood world, beginning to ask God about it, and God was making known to him, don't worry, I'm going to settle this out. We're back to the just shall live by faith, and all the world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. There's some interesting conversations we have ahead of us. Enoch, what did he show you? What did he tell you? By faith, Enoch was translated. Guy's an early rapture candidate. He should not see death. I'd like that option. And he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. I'm so glad it doesn't say without advanced postgraduate degree. <laughs> without degree. Without GED. Without kindergarten diploma. And yet, what is this world so wrapped up in? Accolades. Achievement. Does it buy anything with God? Nothing. Well, then you're saying we shouldn't get educated? No. That's what's going to happen. Your youth will go home. See, I'm not going to college because Pastor Chris said, no. <laughs> he may send some of you there. He may not send some of you there. You know, colleges need missionaries too. But none of those things impress God. Boy, what a reminder to go back and walk among those brick-lined halls. And look around going, this will help you for a limited period of time in your life. But it's not going to bring you to everlasting life. In fact, it may get in the way of it. What's it all really worth? I you know, seldom, if ever, sit at deathbeds with people going, you know, I, I should have given more of the alumni fund. I should have. <laughs> I never hear that. I hear I should have loved my kids more. I should have spent more time with them. I wish I had told this person that. Or I never hear that. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Are there any restrictions to anyone in this room exercising faith? Walking with God in obedience? Is there a first, second, third tier of people who can be involved in faith? I'm sorry, you don't, make, you don't have the prerequisite. Sorry, you, you can, no, no. Is anyone barred? from learning to grow in faith and walking with God and see God move? No. And you can be upstairs in Sunday school and have that door open to you. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Why? For he that cometh to God must believe, number one, that he is. That's the basic 101 of faith. Must believe that he is, number one. Number two, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. As we seek the Lord, as we walk in obedience, we'll find God working in our lives by faith. And by the way, again, keep this verse six is a good memory verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So much for the blood of rams, bulls, and goats. By faith, Noah. How many have heard of him? First service had you guys beat. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things, what does it say? Not seen as yet. What was that? It hadn't rained yet, according to Genesis. How many have seen locust-like demonic creatures with hair like women, teeth like lions, with tails like scorpions that sting people? How many have seen them? Some of you may have. <laughs> the rest of us haven't. Are they coming? That's what Revelation tells us when the shaft of the abyss is open. How many have seen something falling out of the heavens or out of the, the atmosphere outside of space, landing on the water, contaminating them, turning them to what's called wormwood, which was like blood and that people can't eat or drink from it and all these other things. How many have ever seen that? But it's coming. Noah was warned by God of things nobody had seen yet. And he listened and he obeyed God. By faith, Noah, being warned of God's of things not God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, that is awe, and prepared an ark unto the saving of his house, by the which, by the building of the ark, <clears throat> he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by what? Faith. All right, who's he writing to? Hebrews. What's their challenge? Facing persecution, turn away, go back to their Judaism, turn away from Christ. What if Noah hadn't built the ark? What if he was like them and just turned away? Little, little, you know, the guy for a hundred years constructed an ark, as far as we can tell. A hundred years. Neighbors are like, I, I, you're, come on. When are you gonna, do you think he was ever tempted to quit? We have trouble praying 10 minutes for something. The guy plowed for a hundred years. And, you know, think about it. Abraham, great faith. Amen, no argument. He went four times as long as Abraham waiting and didn't give up. And I'm sure got the business from his neighbors. By faith, Noah, believing God, moved with fear, prepared an ark, <clears throat> the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, which became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And I could show you the pictures of how long it is, but we did that in Genesis 6. You can go back and get them. By faith, Abraham. How many have heard of him? All right, a few more of you. Abraham, when he was called to go out unto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he was a pagan worshiping idolater, and God called him. Listen, once again, not all of us will get into certain schools, universities, or programs. But if you're here and you love Jesus, you have been called into the one, of the most, one of the most amazing things this world has ever seen. You have been called to be sons and daughters of God. Behold, it does not yet appear what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We've been invited into the family with incredible privilege. And yet at times we can treat that as common. Abraham obeyed. He went out. What if he hadn't? What if he got to like Haran and said, you know, Ur the Chaldees, rents were cheap, I liked it, and went back. <laughs> Where would the Hebrews be now? Zero. You get the sense he's trying to give him a message? He obeyed. <clears throat> he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents, with Isaac, check this out, and Jacob, who was 15 years old when Abraham died, Lamech, Noah's father coexisted the same time as Adam for about 50 years. Lamech could go straight to Adam and ask him about fellowship with God, being thrown out of the garden, the judgment of God, and all these things. Lamech, Noah's dad, could have a direct conversation of what was it like to walk with God and then hand it directly to Noah. One hop. Abraham here able to speak directly to Jacob for 15 years. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker or artisan is God. 
What city is that? I'm not helping. What city is that? What Jerusalem? The New Jerusalem. What chapter is that found in? Well, it's found in Revelation 21, and I believe also Galatians 4, Paul, long before the book of Revelation, is talking about a new Jerusalem. Abraham, somehow by God's revelation, understood what it took us to get to Revelation 21 to discover. There is a city whose builder and maker is God. Foundations are laid by God himself. And Abraham, that's where he was headed. Once again, faith. That's what he was looking for. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. How old was she? 90. That's a bit past age. <clears throat> because she had judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. No offense, Abraham. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90, and they have Isaac. We use the uh, birthing center down in Bryn Mawr for a bunch of our babies. One time we went down, I think it was with Caleb. We're having some issues. We go in and so they're checking Lori out, doing the whole thing, trying to get some kind of IV thing started. And, and it's not going well. We ended up going home. She actually just, that's it, I'm out of labor. I'm going home. Get this thing out of me. We went home. Took another day and a half. Just telling you what I saw. But as we're sitting there, it dawned on us, we're there at like midnight. <clears throat> That's when all those things happen. We're sitting there looking back and forward, and we realized all the midwives and nurses, everybody there are half our age. <laughs> we kind of got the message, like, hmm, maybe it's time to retire, but <laughs> it was scary. These all died in faith. No law. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And that's what faith is, isn't it? Do we see the world now under complete rule of Christ? No, but it will come. You see, we look back to what God did 2,000 years ago through his son, where the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, whosoever receives him by faith in their heart, we receive this wonderful transaction where God lays on him our sin and through our faith in him by the grace of God, he then lays on us his son's righteousness. He is our substitutionary atonement. He took our place. So we look back to what God did 2,000 years ago. They looked forward. God is going to find a way. God is going to provide. Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. They looked forward to the work of the cross. We look back to it. But we're all looking to God and to the work of God to save us from our sins. The sacrifice he would provide that would make us righteous with God. Not because of our righteousness, but because of Jesus's. Now the author of the Hebrews here is writing to him right as these things happened. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were looking forward. The author of Hebrews was saying, we're looking right at it. It just happened. And for you and I, 2,000 years later, we look back. But we're all looking to Christ. We're all looking to him who died for us. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them, in their case, afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them. That's what faith is about, isn't it? And confessed, you receive, we confess. Confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This is not our home. This is not what God intended. He is something so much better for us when he reigns. For they that say such things, this is not our home, we're waiting for the Lord. They declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. Here's that idea. They, they could have gone back, but they didn't. And because of that, they're going to receive the promise. Who's he writing to? Hebrews. What's their temptation? Turn back. And miss what? The promise. Now, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly. In fact, think about it. We have learned we have a better high priest. Amen? We have learned that we have a better tabernacle, the original in heaven. Amen? 
we have learned that we have been become partakers of the new and better covenant. Amen? Okay. We've also learned that we have a better sacrifice, God's own son. Get this. And we have a better inheritance. We're not going into the land of Canaan. We're going to the new Jerusalem. A better inheritance also. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. There's a thought. <laughs> you ever been out somewhere and someone says, where's your family? They're right over. And just as you say that, one of your kids goes, discovers their finger, fits their nose hole. <laughs> They're over there. They're going. You're like, <sighs> Sorry, I mean, next to the swing set, that family. Is he ashamed to be called your God this morning? How about Abraham lying to Abimelech? And God appears to you, hey, you're dead, man. You better ask him to pray for you. He's a prophet. But he lied to me. God still owns him. He's still my prophet. Let me pray for you. He's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried or tested, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Wait a minute. How many sons did he have? At this point of Isaac's life. How many? Two. Name them. Isaac and Ishmael. Why is he not mentioned? You go back to Genesis 21. Abraham, take now thine son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him up for burnt offering or burnt sacrifice on the mount that I will show you of. And Abraham, you read Genesis 21. And, 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 and. It's a polysynodon. That's where direct, continuous action, by the way it's written. He just, yes, Lord, and did it. How long was the journey? Three days. What's he going to do when he gets there? Offer Isaac. So what is Isaac during those three days in his mind? As good as dead. They get there. Who's Isaac? Son of promise. To who? The father. And so they go there. They get to this Mount, Mount Moriah. He puts the wood on the back of the son of promise while the father goes up with the son to the top of Mount Moriah where he's going to be offered up a burnt sacrifice. What's built on Mount Moriah today? The Temple Mount. What's at the top of Mount Moriah? Golgotha or Calvary? Where Christ was crucified. So the father takes the son of promise who has the wood on his back, who's dead in his mind for as good as three days and takes him up to Calvary. The son of the promise is going to be offered up as a sacrifice. Abraham takes out the knife. The angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Now I know that you fear God. Oh, Abraham believed God long ago, but now he proved it as James 2 tells us. Now he demonstrated his faith. And it'll tell us here exactly why. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He is the very son of promise. So Abraham, by faith, accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, whereof also he has received him in a figure. So the father takes the son of promise, who's dead in his mind as good as three days, puts a one on his back, takes him up, and receives him back again. Death and resurrection. And there are two half prophecies in that detailed event. Father, here's the wood, the sacrifice. Here's the wood, here's the fire, the knife. Where is the sacrifice? First half of the prophecy, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Second half of the prophecy, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Put them together. God will provide himself a lamb. And in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Calvary. Faith. Abraham. By faith, Isaac. Jacob. Blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And that was an interesting event you can read in Genesis 27. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying... Blessed both his, the sons of Joseph in worship, leaning upon the top of his staff. He told the tribes who would lead, Israel will have the scepter. It will not depart until Shiloh, the one who makes peace, comes. He told them how they would divide the land before they even left Egypt. By faith, he told them exactly where their portions would be. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones to take his body out. And they did. By faith, Moses. Everybody heard of him? What did God give through Moses? The law. How many are still with me? How many are back in like two verses ago? The law. So the one who gives the law, how does he start? By faith. Anybody catch that? Nobody? 
Nobody. By faith, Moses, the great lawgiver himself, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Ooh, ooh, wait a minute. What's going on? Who's this written to? Hebrews. What are they facing? Persecution. So what are they doing? Turning away from the gospel. What if Moses' parents behave like that? I guess we better just toss them in the Nile with the rest of them. Where would Israel be then? How many get the hint? Dear Hebrews, what if the rest of your forefathers played this game that you are of turning away from what God has made clearly known and refusing to walk in obedience? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See if this rings any bells slowly with our text. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Is that loud and clear to the audience of the Hebrews? A little side note. The pleasures of sin for a season. Is sin pleasurable? Some of you are like, oh, can I say that? <laughs> Is it? If it wasn't, you wouldn't get tempted. How many like to donate blood like three times a week? <laughs> None of you. One in the back. We'll keep an eye on you. You're not, you don't go like, you don't, blood mobile. Oh, no, I shouldn't. No, I shouldn't. Oh, I got to do it. You're not tempted by that. You're like, vroom, you know. This week at the office will be a blood mobile. Look at that at a lunch meeting. Look at that. Sorry. But sin, oh, that's tempting. And it is pleasurable for a season. And some seasons can run longer than others. But eventually there is a bill to be paid. Eventually there comes the consequences of sinful behavior whether from heartache, body ache, whatever the case may be. And by the way, you might skate through this entire lifetime. But if you persist in sin and you reject God's son, there will be a payday. And that payday is since you'd refuse to allow God to put his wrath on his son in your place, you refuse that offer, God now puts his wrath on you. And it won't be so pleasurable anymore because of his judgment. Moses rather chose to suffer the affliction of the people of God Unlike you Hebrews who are being tempted because of persecution to leave Christ. He stuck it out. Esteeming the reproach. Look at this. This is so ripe into what they're dealing with. Moses esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And meanwhile, these guys are leaving. For he had respect under the recompense, the wages of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt. Here it is again. Not fearing the wrath of the king. This is over and over a message to him. He wasn't afraid. So why are you? For he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover, complete type of Christ, the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Who did that one? Joshua. What if he, like these Hebrews that he's writing to, you know, day six, I can't, I am so tired of them making fun of us. I am so tired of going, forget it. We're done, done. That's it, we're done. Would Jericho be taken? No, it was the seventh day that it went down. What if Joshua behaved like these guys? By faith, he compassed it seven days. By faith, what does it say next? Verse 31, by faith, the harlot, Rahab. You, man, <laughs> couldn't you even like at least said Rahab the harlot? Can't we talk about the girl before we talk about her problem? No, the harlot, Rahab, by faith. Where does she live? Jericho. What's the deal with Jericho? What are they being delivered over to? The ban, it said, the ban. Judgment, that is complete destruction of the city because of their wickedness. Nothing taken out as a spoil. Nothing leaves. It is all completely destroyed and under the devotion of God. It, that is a judgment of God against them. Don't touch a thing. There's a guy named Achan who took something and because of it, he's Achan, but you have to go read it. It was under destruction. She lives in a town that has been, has been the line has been crossed and God has said, the town is done. My judgment has come. That is it. And what's her profession? A harlot. You got a harlot. Go read Leviticus 18 and elsewhere. It's a problem. You got a harlot living in a town that's doomed to destruction. 
Who's delivered? Was she delivered by keeping the law? How did she get out? Faith. I'm so glad it's not, you know, the liar, Pastor Chris, the idiot, Pastor Chris, the adulterer, Pastor Chris, the fornicator, Pastor Chris, the drunkard, Pastor Chris. You know, when he, Jesus is at Simon the leper's house, remember that? He's eating there. You wonder, people are like, why did they call you Simon the leper? Oh, because I used to be a leper, but now I've been healed. Well, then why don't you just call you Simon? Oh, no, I want people to call me Simon the leper because then they'll ask me and I can tell them what happened. By faith, the harlot, Rahab. By the way, there's a gal named Tamar before her, <clears throat> married to two of Judah's sons. He refused to give her the third. So she decided to dress up as a harlot and then ended up entrapping Judah and having a child with him, two, child, two children. So Tamar played the harlot. <clears throat> Rahab is a harlot. And then there's Bathsheba. What was her sin? Adultery. And where are these three women found? In the lineage of Jesus Christ. Grace. God can't use me. I've messed my life up too much. Uh, are you in a town under destruction and a professional harlot? Why, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, then there's room for you. <laughs> Rahab perished not with them that believed not. But when she had received the spice with peace, she demonstrated her faith. What more shall I say? For time shall fail me to tell of Gideon, who defeated the Midianites on Mount Moray, of Barak with Deborah, who defeated Sisera, and then there's Yael. Remember her? Sweet little gal who drove a tent stake through the temples of Sisera's head after she gave milk and cookies? <laughs> you know what happened? She nailed him. <laughs> I love that one. But Deborah and Barak, who defeated Sisera, Samson. Did Samson always get it right? No, he stumbled, but he did come back in the end. And that should be an encouragement to these Hebrews. Of Jephthah, I call him Jephthah, and you'll know why after we do his vow on Wednesday night in Leviticus 27. Jephthah. Of David, David who? David who? King David, thank you. And of Samuel, wait a second, who's missing? Who's between Samuel and David? Saul, why is he not mentioned? Because he turned back. That's a note to the Hebrews. They know their history. And there's David and there's Saul. Wait, Saul's not here. Why is he not here? He turned back. What are they being tempted with turning back? He's not even mentioned. How many sons were mentioned of Abraham's? Why is the other one ignored? Why does the other son get ignored? Because he's a work of the flesh. Why is Saul ignored? Think about it. Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises like Hannah and 1 Samuel, stopped the mouths of lions, who did that? Daniel 6, quenched the violence of fire, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, Elisha and Elijah did, out of weakness were made strong, Hezekiah when he was sick, Samson again, waxed valiant in fight, David over and over, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, the Shumanite and others. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Second Maccabees 7 has some details of that around the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, that they might obtain a better resurrection. These people didn't turn back. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. All right. Not that kind of stoned. Stoned with stones, like Zechariah. They were sawn asunder, tradition says Isaiah was by Manasseh. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. When they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Look at this. Of whom the world was not worthy. Not a single degree among them. Not a single paper published. Not a single review magazine with their data, their information, or their thesis. Not a single building named for them. And yet they're the heroes. Because they took what God gave them. And they ran with it. And so we still read about their exploits. 
thousands of years later. God is never impressed with what we can produce. But when we walk in faith, now we please him. You've got a brand new year ahead of you. There's some real strange things afoot in the world community. And you know the truth. And if you're bold and you're willing to tell people about the truth, we might see the greatest in gathering we've ever seen. But we have to be willing to take what God has given us, the truth of the knowledge of Christ, the change heart, the invitation into his family, and do something with it. Not be afraid. The world was not worthy of these people. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves. No five-star accommodations there. And these all having obtained a good report, how? Through faith. Received not the promise. They were looking forward to a work of God. God having provided some better thing for us. What is it? That in various times and in diverse manners, sundry times, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. They looked forward to it. We see it. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, those who've gone ahead of us, let us lay aside every weight, let me translate. Let's get rid of the monkey stuff that we're playing with. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, just as they did, the author and finisher of our faith. I am so glad it doesn't say the author and hopeful encourager of our faith. Finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him. Wait a second, look up. Who was that joy? You were. No, no, the person next to me, he went, no, you were. That you would be found believing I, the report, as Isaiah said. You would be found in Christ. You were the joy set before him. So I hope you know him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, the ultimate example despising the shame. He didn't turn back. He sat down on the right hand of the throne of God, as promised in Psalm 110. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and you faint in your minds. Well, we're out of time. We're going to pick it up here next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. Oh God, faith. Trusting you. Trusting you and we don't yet see the results. Trusting you and it doesn't seem like we have a clue or a chance. And yet trusting you because you say you are faithful. I think of Matthew 6. Which of you by worrying can make yourself one cupid taller? If you cannot do such a small thing, why do you worry about what you eat or what you wear? Look at the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. God clothes them, God feeds them. How much more will we take care of us, O you of little faith? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Lord, forgive us as we live in a society that constantly seeks us to be dissatisfied. Our computers aren't good enough, our cars aren't good enough, our homes aren't good enough, our clothes aren't good enough, and our food's not good enough. Otherwise, they can't sell us more of the same. Lord, may this year be a year where we grow in faith and we watch you move in amazing ways because we don't turn back and we're not afraid. We'd rather face the music for you and receive the blessing than go hide and never invest. Be with us, Father, this week. Thank you for your word again and for your great faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.